Hey everyone, I hope you all are doing well. So recently, there has been talks about the Maroons settlement in Jamaica and whether they are a state within Jamaica, separate and apart from the general population. Maroons, particularly in the cockpit country, are in a heated debate with the Prime Minister of Jamaica, Andrew Holness, who does not see the group as separate from the general population and states that there is only one sovereign state in Jamaica and he will not fund or use taxpayers' dollars to support any requests from the Akompong town. So one of the major issues that the Maroons are having with the Jamaican government is in regard to the peace treaty that was signed between the British and the Maroons in 1738. In that peace treaty, the Maroons were allotted 1,500 acres of land to be theirs forever. Now the Jamaican government wants to collect taxes on on those land and also they want to expand bauxite mining which would end up in the cockpit country inevitably it would be forcing the maroons off their land so the maroons in the cockpit country are fighting for their rights according to the peace treaty from 1738 let's get into it some people really believe that um, maroons are things of the past. But today, I can assure that I am a true born maroon and I am alive. Uh, it was miraculous to know how it happens, but it did happen in truth. Nanny, scientifically works our way out and the British has got to subdue by asking for a peace treaty to be signed betwixt the Maroons and the British government. And it was so done with the signing of both British blood and Maroon blood. It was also mixed with rum and was drunk by each party as a hoot that there should be no war again with the Maroons and the British government. And because of that, I am happy to be a Maroon today as a freedom fighter and it was it was so happy that a few years after Maroon got their freedom then the government find it possible to give freedom to the rest of our um, slaves the first day of August in that year so, today we are happy that Jamaica is a free country, beginning from the Maroons who fought strenuously for freedom, for the areas. From the very moment some Africans were captured to be sold into servitude in the Caribbean, they were planning their escape. They were skilled and cunning warriors, tribal leaders who had a zest for freedom. They had absolutely no intention of submitting themselves to their enslavers. Thus it was no wonder how many of them abandoned the plantations, fled into the interiors of Jamaica, and this created headache and embarrassment for the British militia whose pursuits were unyielding. It was their flight to the mountains that perhaps earned them the moniker Maroon. The word Maroon is derived via French from the Spanish word Cimarron, meaning wild or untamed. The rough and rugged terrains of the interiors of the island to which the Maroons fled were ideal for guerrilla warfare, which they waged against the British. 
their knowledge of the area and regions were unmatched by the British and many of them died in the unbearable conditions in the hills. The dense vegetations, the streams, the rivers, waterfalls, caves and underground paths were used to confuse and frustrate the British. In the west, the almost impenetrable cockpit country, which is a series of steep cliffs and hillocks covered with trees and undergrowth, was their haunt and refuge. On the 31st of July 1690, there was a rebellion involving 500 slaves who came from the Sutton Estate in the parish of Clarendon, which led to the formation of Jamaica's most stable and best organized maroon group. Although some were killed, recaptured, or they surrendered, more than 200 slaves, including women and children, remained free after the rebellion ended. They then established an Ashanti-style polity based in the western parts of the Coptic country, notably Kojo's town, which was in Trelawney. Kojo is the most famous ruler of the western Maroons. They incorporated outsiders only after newcomers had satisfied a strict probationary period. At this time, the leaders who emerged in the eastern Maroons were Queo and Queen Nani. The windward Maroons in the wilder parts of eastern Jamaica were all Always composed of separate, highly mobile, and culturally heterogeneous groups. By about 1720, a stronger windward community had developed, and around the culturally Africanized group of three villages known as Nani Town, under the spiritual leadership of Queen Nani, who is an Ashanti woman, sometimes in allegiance and sometimes in competition with other windward groups. She was known for her exceptional leadership skills especially in guerrilla warfare during the first maroon war one of the tactics particular to the jamaican maroons it involved the art of camouflage using plants kojo rejected suggestions of a treaty in 1734 and 1736 but by 1738 he agreed to parley with john Guthrie. this local planter and militia officer was known to and respected by the maroons in in 1739, the treaty signed under British Governor Edward Trelawney and it granted Kojo's Maroon 1,500 acres of land between their strongholds of Trelawney Town and a compound in the cockpit country and a certain amount of political autonomy and economic freedoms in return for which the Maroons were to provide military support in case of an invasion or rebellion and to return runaway slaves in exchange for a bounty of $2 each. This last clause in the treaty caused tension between the Maroons and the enslaved black population, although from time to time runaways from the plantations still found their way into Maroon settlements. So in addition to that, a British superintendent was to be assigned to live in each Maroon town. In 1740, there were similar treaties that were signed by Cuello and Nani, who were major leaders of the Windward Maroons. The Windward Maroons were originally located at Crawford Stone and the new Nani town, it's now called more tone. In all, about 600 Maroons came to terms with the British authorities through these two treaties. But not all the Maroons accepted the treaties. Rebellions occurred in Maroon communities in the years that followed. After the treaties, the white superintendents appointed by the governors eventually took control of the Maroon towns. And in the 1740s, some leeward Maroons who opposed the 1739 treaty rose in revolt. But Kojo crushed those rebellions. And then in 1754, Cuello he attempted to overthrow Edward Crawford, who was the new Maroon leader of the Windward Maroon Town, and in the resulting conflict, Crawford's town was destroyed. Governor Charles Noels, he then re-established control over the uprising with the help of other Maroons. He then ordered that the Maroons of Crawford's town be resettled in the new nearby windward Maroon towns of Charlestown, Jamaica and Scotts Hall, Jamaica. 
the Maroon population grew from 664 in 1739 to 1,288 in 1796, a time when both the slave population and the white settler communities were ravaged by disease. Then in April 1760, the Jamaican government called upon the Maroons to honor their treaties and come to their assistance during the major slave uprising led by Fante Lida Taki in St. Mary. The Windward Maroons were first to be mobilized. Their intervention at first appeared half-hearted. The Scots Hall Maroons began by claiming outstanding arrears in bounty, while those Charleston Maroons at Downs Cove allegedly took cover when attacked by rebels. However, the Maroon warriors were employing guerrilla warfare tactics which contradicted the British military tradition of marching into the oncoming fire. In the end, it was a Scots Hall Maroon Lieutenant David the Maroon who killed Taki during a skirmish. The loss of Taki's leadership essentially ended the initial rebellion. In Western Jamaica, a Pongo led another slave rebellion, which was inspired by Taki's revolt, which lasted from April 1760 to October 1761. Kojo's well-trained forces were mobilized to help deal with them with some degree of success. And then in the years that followed Taki's rebellion, many Maroon officers such as Samuel Grant, allegedly the son of Davy, made a career out of hunting runaway slaves for the colonial authorities. These runaway slaves formed informal Maroon communities, modeled along the lines of the official Maroon communities before they came to terms. In the 18th century, Maroons also hunted and killed notorious escaped slaves with their deputies such as Ancoma, Three-Fingered Jack, and Daga. However, while they were successful in capturing and killing some runaways with their leaders, most members of the runaway Maroon communities continued to thrive under new leaders. White superintendents took command at the Maroon towns and the Maroon officers were relegated to their subordinates. After Taki's war, the governor appointed a separate superintendent for each of the five Maroon towns. These superintendents reported to the superintendent general who in turn reported to the governor. In the Second Maroon War, which began in 1795, the treaties that followed the First Maroon War had called for the assignment of white superintendent in each Maroon community. Trelawney Town had objected to the official recently assigned to them and eventually they expelled him. At this time, there was a new hardline governor by the name of Balcaris who sent William Fitch to march on Trelawney Town with a military force to demand their immediate submission. Balcaris ignored the advice of local planters who suggested that giving the Maroons some more land in order to avoid conflict would work in their best interest. Instead, the governor demanded that the Maroons surrender unconditionally, provoking a conflict that could have been avoided. The Trelawney Maroons, who were led by their Colonel Montague James, chose to fight and he was initially successful fighting a guerrilla war in a small band under several captains of whom the most noted were Johnson, Parkinson and Palmer. The casualties suffered by Fitch and his men were significantly higher than those felt by the Maroons of Trelawney Town. When the Trelawney Town Maroons killed Fitch, several of his officers, some Akongpong Maroon trackers and many militia soldiers, in an ambush, Balcaris appointed a new general who was George Walpole. This new general suffered more setbacks until he eventually opted to besiege the cockpit country on a massive scale scale, surrounding it with watch posts, firing in shells from a long distance, and intended to destroy or cut off all maroon provision grounds. Meanwhile, the maroons attempted to recruit plantation slaves, which was met with mixed responses, though a large number of runaway slaves they gained their freedom by fighting for Trelawney Town. Other maroon communities maintained neutrality, but the Akompong Town, however, fought on the side of the colonial militias against Trelawney Town. 
Despite signs that the siege was working, Balcaris, he grew impatient and sent to Cuba for a hundred dogs and handlers. The reputation of these dogs and handlers were fearsome and their arrival quickly prompted the surrender of the majority of the Trelawney forces. The Akampong Maroons, however, only agreed to put down their arms on condition that they would not be deported and Walpole, he gave his word that that would be the case. But to Walpole's dismay, Balcaris refused to treat with the defeated Maroons and had them deported from Jamaica, first to Nova Scotia and then to the new British colony of Sierra Leone, and joined the African-American founders who established Sierra Leone and the settlement of Freetown, Sierra Leone. From the 1830s, we had some Maroons or their descendants return to Jamaica to work as free laborers, and many of them settled in the village of Flagstaff near the old site of Trelawney Town. The descendants of the returned Maroons live in Flagstaff today. That is Kojo's town, Trelawney Town. Trelawney Town was the largest Maroon town, so the population of the Maroons in Jamaica was significantly dented by their deportation. When the colonial authorities deported the Maroons of Trelawney Town, they left a void which was filled by communities of runaway slaves. The Maroons of the smaller town of Akompong were unable to cope with the growing numbers of runaways in western Jamaica who found refuge in the cockpit country. The Akompong Maroons tried but failed in their attempts to disperse the runaway community of Kofi, who established a community of runaway slaves in the cockpit country in 1798. When Kofi's Maroon group faded from the colonial records, their place was taken by another group of runaways who established themselves in the cockpit country in 1812. The Maroon community also resisted attempts by the Okompong Maroons and the colonial militias to disperse them in the 1820s. A large Maroon group of runaway slaves established themselves near Hellshire Beach in southern Jamaica and it thrived there for years until it was finally dispersed by a party of windward Maroons in 1819. The Maroons played a significant role in helping the colonial authorities to suppress the Samuel Sharp Revolt in 1831-32 under the leadership of white superintendents such as Alexander Fay. Sharp's Baptist War persuaded the British government to end the system of slavery, which they did in the years following the rebellion. After that, the colonial authorities had no use for the Maroons, and they passed the Maroon Allotments Act in 1842 and abolished the post of superintendents in the 1850s. Their attempts to break up the Maroon communal land, while partially successful in Charlestown and Scotts Hall, met with Maroon resistance in a compound town and more town. After the Second Maroon War, the colonial authorities converted Trelawney into a military barracks and renamed it Maroon Town, Jamaica. The Trelawney Maroons, they flourished in Sierra Leone at first, but their situation had soon soured and they submitted petitions to British government asking for permission to return to Jamaica. These petitions were turned down. However, in 1831, another petition was presented by 224 Sierra Leone Maroons to the British government, and this time the Jamaican authorities relented. They responded by saying they would place no obstacle in the way of Maroons returning to Jamaica, but would not pay any passage or for the purchase of lands in the island. In all, 64 Maroons left Sierra Leone for Jamaica. A combination of more town Maroons, including some who resided in Hayfield and Bath, they committed a number of atrocities before they captured Bogle. However, their cruelty in suppressing the uprising attracted a lot of criticism from Methodist missionaries and residents of St. Thomas Parish Church in Jamaica.
Maroons in the 21st century today in Jamaica are to a small extent autonomous and separate from Jamaican culture. Those of a compong have preserved their land since 1739. The isolation used to their advantage by their ancestors has today resulted in their communities being amongst the most inaccessible on the island. Today in Jamaica, we have four maroon towns that are still existing. They are a compong town, Moortown, Charlestown, and Scotts Hall. They hold land titles that were allotted to them in 1739 and 1740 through treaties with the British. These Maroons still maintain their traditional celebrations and practices, some of which have West African origin. It was such ingenuity that contributed to the military successes of the early Maroons. They were, after all, the first black guerrilla fighters in the New World. Today, their memory lives on in this practice, reenacted during special ceremonies, such as this one, presided over by the Colonel and Assistant Secretary of Mortem. close tie between Maroon healers and the spirits of their ancestors is an important part of traditional Maroon culture. It creates a bridge between the present and the past, and blends a sense of continuity to Maroon society over the generations. Hopwood, the assistant secretary of the Moortown Maroons, is an accomplished Cromanti drummer. In times of crisis, the Cromanti drum may be used to invoke Maroon spirits to come and possess the living. In this form, the spirits offer their aid. More town, man. It's the capital. Yeah, man. More town is the capital of Earth, you know. There's no place on Earth like the capital. What do you say? It's the Maroon roots. No truth. More town, Earth, capital. Strictly. In More Town, there is a strong sense of continuity with the Maroon past. For all the changes that have come to Moortown in the last century, there remain many elements connecting today's lifestyle to that of earlier years. Although they are Jamaican citizens, the Moortown Maroons are still governed in the tradition of the treaty by an elected council and chief officer called the Colonel, Colonel C.L.G. Harris. My duty as Colonel simply stated is to work for the betterment, the all-round betterment of our community. But as you may well surmise, there are several facets of this rather large sphere of responsibility. Some of these, a few of them are, I must preside at all meetings, committee meetings and township meetings. I must make representations to the government on behalf of my people. I must settle disputes, particularly those involving more than one claimant to a, any special parcel of land. And uh, I'm expected to see about all cases of non-maroons who come to more town, searching for knowledge as far as our history is concerned. As in the past, land in and around Moortown is communally held by the Maroons as a group, although it is divided up into small farms cultivated and maintained by individuals. The Maroons are still not required to pay taxes on these lands. The farmers of Moortown continue to follow the time-tested traditions of their ancestors. Using the clearing technique known as slash and burn, they grow a few basic subsistence crops, mostly tubers such as yams, dasheen, and cocoa. Farming along the steep slopes is formidable. With cutlass, hoe, and fork, the soil must be worked and the seed sown. So the grandparents planted, and so their grandparents before them. Jamaica is a unitary, sovereign state. There is no other sovereign authority in Jamaica other than the government of Jamaica. 
I want that to be absolutely clear. None. And under my leadership, not one inch of Jamaica will come under any other sovereign authority. I think I finish the statement. I need to jab back, but I think back and go back in a chair and think again and come back with a different statement. I understand what I'm saying. Who is Maroon? Because we know the peace treaty we sign, you know. You understand what I'm saying. Who are we going to sign the peace treaty? You understand what I'm saying? Bloodshed for you. Bloodshed for you, some man. I don't. Well, what the Prime Minister said, he wrong. Because they have ready know that Maroon Town is a state within a state. We are sovereign. Whenever I speak, you know, say something like that about Maroon. I think I'm going to win next time, in next election. The Maroon chief and his people have been strident in their stance about mining in and around the cockpit country where their territorial lands are situated. The inadequacies of um, the agencies that have, that have um, given these approvals uh, for mining there still lies a lot of questions, right, as to the, 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 the true uh, purpose of wanting to mine the cockpit country because we know where bauxite is and we know what was happening on the global markets with bauxite. So we know what the true story is. The fact of the matter is people are being displaced, farming lands are being torn apart, and people are suffering health-wise from bauxite. We saw the major fish kill the other day. Right? And when you look at what sanctions and what, 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 what the authorities have done, it doesn't speak to a, a government that really wants to, 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 to protect this environment. That, you know, um, as leaders, we have a responsibility and um, a duty to the people to ensure that when we communicate, we communicate effectively, clearly, and also seek all measures, all, all, all measures that are available to de-escalate and address situations before they become um, otherwise. was the only entrance to the Maroon village because we never make road or anything because the English in them big shoes couldn't mind them a place here that's why they couldn't have access to Scotland we always use the river as a road I do believe that the African Maroons are a sovereign people and this is because when they arrived in Jamaica they were from African descendants and they arrived on an island that was full of Spanish people Spaniards the Arawaks the Spanish Maroons so they were never a part of that culture when they arrived here they decided that they were not going to be enslaved so they hid up in the interiors of the mountains and formed their own groups when the British took over from the Spanish they then tried to force the Maroons out but they were applying guerrilla warfare tactics the British then decided that it didn't make any sense using all their resources fighting a war so instead they decided to treaty with the Maroons and gave them several acres of land and had them fighting on their side instead of against them now the treaty was amended but the Maroons have never acknowledged it to this day they're also a sovereign people because they practice different cultures from the general population of jamaica and they are still hidden from the rest of jamaica many jamaicans do not know how the Akompong town or any maroon settlements look so they have reserved their culture and their heritage which makes them different from the jamaican population so the jamaican government passed a land reform tax and the maroons are obliged to pay tax Taxes. this they have refused unto this day they have even drafted documents the Jamaican government of how they want to split the lands amongst themselves and the Maroons and the Maroons are refusing this they just feel like these are their British enslavers who are trying to get them off a land that they fought long and hard for and just like their ancestors they're going to fight to the death to keep what is theirs 
So we have now reached the end of the video and my hope is that you have all learned something but what I'd like you to do if you can is sound off in the comment section below and tell me what you think about this whole situation regarding the Jamaican government and the Maroons. Do you think that they have rights to that land? Do you think that they are a sovereign people? Let me know. I'll see you all in the next video. Until then, take care of yourselves. One love. A leaked cabinet document has said government ministries, departments and agencies have been urged not to engage with or fund secessionist Maroons who are asserting sovereignty from the Jamaican state. Though none of the island's five Maroon groups was named, the recommendation appeared to target the chief Richard Curry-led Akampong village that claims authority over sections of the cockpit country, swathes of biodiverse lands in western and central Jamaica. The recommendation threatens funding such as sponsorship by the Tourism Enhancement Fund of the Akampong Maroon village in St. Elizabeth and comes amid heated conflict fired by Curry's separatist rhetoric since his election in February 2021. The correspondence stated that there must be no acceptance of or acquiescence to any language or suggestion regarding sovereignty or indigenous rights, and no funds must be placed at the disposal of any person or entity claiming such.